Welcome to Santa Barbara Talks with Josh Molina. It's my pleasure today to be here with somebody who's doing a tremendous job in this community, who I have uh, recently just sort of, uh, you know, he's kind of come on my radar and I'm kind of just like impressed and fascinated with all the really interesting good work he's doing. Uh, Michael Montenegro, how are you today? I'm doing great. Thank you for uh, inviting, me in part, uh, inviting me to be a part of your podcast, Josh. Yeah, you know, you have this rapidly growing and really cool um, Instagram site, Chicano Culture SB, and you're also a filmmaker, and, um, you know, you, you do a lot of work uh, in the community, uh, you know, you're a Chicano historian, or, you know, a historian, really, you know, and, and um, I want to just have a wide-ranging conversation with you about all of these, all these topics, you know, um, Oh, I, and you know, I'm Mexican American. I'm part Apache Indian. I've got some European blood, some Irish blood in me. You know, we, we all have a lot of different kinds of background. You know, and so um, I and and I wanted to just sort of talk to you about what it means to be Mexican American in in, in Santa Barbara and, and you know our experiences. So thanks a lot for for taking the time. Let's start with uh, with Chicano Culture SB and your Instagram site, because that's where I sort of first became aware of you. And, you know, my Instagram, I'd be looking and be like, wow, what's all this stuff? This is these are cool images. Like I, I haven't really seen these anywhere else. I mean, I've seen them, but not on anyone's Instagram site. And you got these cool pictures, a little bit of history. You have brown faces. You have faces that you may not necessarily see, you know, in mainstream media on your Instagram. Yeah. So can you talk to me a little bit about the origin of, of um, Chicano Culture SB and how you started it and why? Yeah, absolutely. And it would be my pleasure. So um, for everyone out there, uh, you know, to make it easier for the folks who are listening, if you want to read the article, I've been interviewed by The Independent, just put you know, Chicano Culture SB, Michael Montenegro, you could learn, you could, I've been published by them. So if you want to get more details, but to focus on my project, uh, I established it in 2014 as just a natural duty to, you know, represent and, you know, have representation with our stories. Um, yeah, I took, I took Chicano studies in Chicano studies, with Manuel Anzueta, you know, the legend, legend muralist in, in Santa Barbara. So many of his murals uh, are of his and so many generations he's mentored. Uh, so I was really fortunate. I took his course. I changed my mind with the idea of being Chicano, you know, fast forward 2014. That's where like Facebook was really, really peaking at that time, in the mid 2000s. And um, at that time, I was working for this social media marketing company called uh, DG Bunch, and they ran. They they uh, pretty much the guy that ran it, Lance Rio. He's like my mentor. Um, he had a bunch of other pages, you know, being Latino, being Puerto Rican, being Chicano, and etc. Uh, I've you know I've linked up with some other folks. Long story short, I was running being Chicano, and I was able to get it from like thirty thousand to over like three hundred thousand. And in, uh, in a really short time. And the reason why is because I was creating like authentic content. So, mm -hmm. you know, that's, that's a part of my, of my title. Yes. I, I'm a, I'm like a filmmaker. Uh, yes. I'm a historian, but to, um, to be all inclusive, I, I just say I'm a, I'm a digital content creator and also a community historian. Um, you know, I'm the founder of Chicano Culture SB. Um, but yeah, um, it's a community project. So with that said, 2014, I was working for them. And I was like, you know what? I need to have my own page, my own brand and, and like my own like thing because I didn't own that page. And uh, I started that. And uh, from there, just did little by little. It started in Facebook. Uh, so if you go on Chicano Culture uh, SB or the Santa Barbara, um, you can see my very first post and see the growth of, of my content and my writing. Um, then from there, um, I also founded the Santa Barbara mural bike ride. I've always been um, extremely passionate about murals and how murals rolls in the community. Um, so, yeah, I founded that. You can also find the article on the independent. Um, so, yeah, I'm all about cycling, murals, history, tours, um, engaging with people. So, yeah, and with that and um, Fast forward in today, um, you know, consistency. And I think that's like one of my best advice for every, uh, for every folk 
uh, person, people out there who's listening is to um, be consistent. You know, anyone could start up a, like a, a Instagram page or Facebook, whatever, TikTok, but like, what's your brand about? Like, what are you doing? Are you doing it for fun? Are you doing it as a, as a duty, you know, I'm like, or if you don't know, just do it, just be consistent, try your best. Mm-hmm. Um, so yeah, I did that. And um, yeah, it's like I said, I started Facebook and I was like, and I actually really only got into Instagram, like maybe like two years ago. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, and you know, little by little started getting mm-hmm. um, more followers and uh, I never pay for advertising. I make all my content original. Um, you know, I'm all m- more about the caliber of your, of your followers. I don't really care about the numbers. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and also like, I, I do it more just quality of the stories. I do it, you know, like one of your questions is like, how do I do the process? Yeah. And I just, you know, like one of the words I said, it's like the natural duty. So some stuff I do have planned. I have all kinds of unfinished projects, so many cool stuff. Um, but you know, I have a life. No one pays me to do this. So um, I try my best and, you know, I make posts, you know, sometimes tragedies happen. Sometimes I, I'm in the right time and place and, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm on break and someone sends me a photo and be like, yeah, I can repost it right now. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes. And also since it's a community platform, you know, since, what's the purpose, you know, our mission statement is to, um, this is something I developed because I was like, wow, you know, what's, what, what's this, what's our mission? You know, I am just one person, but I feel like I'm serving a community. Like a lot of people message me. I, I have a lot of, uh, priceless relationships with older generations, um, that, that mean the world to me. And, um, so with that said, um, I don't know. It's just, it's just kind of like an organic process. And, you know, when it comes to criteria, what type of stuff uh, goes on the, on the page, um, it's essentially I cover, well, going back to the mission statement, to empower youth and foster community pride. That's what essentially what my page does, my community project, my brand um it does that and uh, that's my duty and um we're now going to criteria geographically i like to cover um from the 805 the 805 is for me it's from santa maria area you know including you know san Barra county to all the way to oxnard you know to like Phil, uh, Fillmore, santa paula um that area that geographic area is very uh, um, important to Santa Barbara or just historically, you know, when it comes to like farming and migratory uh, seasons of, you know, people from Santa Barbara, Campesinos from back in the day would go to Oxnard to go pick the, the beats, um, you know, watching the tide because there wasn't a bridge back in the day. Mm-hmm. And, you know, anyways, so that's, that's what I like to do, but I like to mainly focus on Santa Barbara, mm-hmm. Galita and Carpinteria. Where and, do you uh, get your, your images from? So people will send you stuff and ask you to post it. And then do you take pic- your own pictures around town? And a lot of times, like I'll see, you'll have like a vintage uh, poster or like Casa de la Raza, like mm-hmm. something that is a historical sort of artifact. How, how do you get your images? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's, it's a whole combination of things. Um, people personally send it to me um i do like detective work i have my resources online mm-hmm. and you know it's a constant you know that that's the thing with today since we live in the informational age you know there's so much information out there it's more about like how can you find it you know it's like using every type of clues and co- like cross-referencing situations um like for example the image behind me you know, it was done by Anthony Preto, a little spider who was from Santa Barbara and a great uh, community uh, leader. Um, he, um, you know, I'll just duck down a little bit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> it says uh, Santa Bruta. And uh, it was, 
published in the Lowrider magazine when Sony Madrid was around. So um, that's type, that's like the type of type of research I do. You know, I go friend, I go to friends. Like I have this uh, one friend, one homie, uh, John Medina from uh, Golden Eagle Tattoo. Um, you know, he let me uh, check out his uh, Lowrider magazines, like vintage Lowrider magazines, because I have that trust with him and he supports my work and. So I, I go about stuff like that and I go into, you know, since my work is acting like academic in a way, I, but I always like to write it in a way where it's easy to digest so anyone can read it. So, you know, I check books, you know, I could show you an example, mm-hmm. you know, and I have a post for folks who want to know more about this. You know, I, this is um, Chicanos in a Changing Society by Albert Camarillo, and it was published in 1979, and it focuses on the history of Santa Barbara from 1848 to 1930, and it's amazing. Mm. And um, and this essentially has been like the the foundation of my work because going to being a historian, you know, I'm I'm personal friends with Neil Graffy, um, and um, Tom Medrugo. Um, Madrago from uh, the Galita historian, you know, I, I'm humbly saying I am well respected as a historian with other um, big names in town. So my niche is like, you know, this a lot of this information is common, but I'm saying I'm t- I'm telling it from a Chicano perspective, mm-hmm. and that's where like the white or white perspective or whatever type of perspective, because so many of us have so many identities that intersect and you know everyone's different experience is different but it's just amazing how much of a difference i've you know it makes it just makes a difference when you're telling it from a different perspective and focusing on the you know our history you know i I watched a went on your vimeo and i watched a couple of the the videos that were publicly available there and uh Mm -hmm. um Crossing Hollister was one of the, you know, the short films that, uh, that you did. And uh, a couple of the others I saw. And what I was impressed with, you know, and, or what, what, what I appreciated, not really mm-hmm. impre- appreciated, was your, your, your like, uh, hunger, your desire, your, your, your desire to um, be curious and inform really shows in your filmmaking. I really appreciate that because to a lot of people, Galita is, or Old Town Galita is just that. It's just like this area where you, there's shops and, you know, there's stores and it's a lot of traffic and it's crowded and it doesn't mean anything to them, particularly with the generational sort of transformation that we've had, you know, with so many people who go to school at DP or San Marcos and then they can't afford to live here and then they move out. And then we have all these tech people who come in and they go to UCSB and then they're like, why is old town Galita so crappy, you know, like, why can't we fix it up? And it's like, you know, yeah, there's a lot of people that this is their home. This is their community. It's disrespectful to be talking, you know, that way. And what I noticed in your films is that you really try to capture the, the, the importance and the significance of that situation to the people who live that way, you know, Mm -hmm. as opposed to you or as opposed to a filmmaker trying to, like tell the story through their eyes, you know, you're really telling the story through their eyes. And so I'm wondering if you could just talk about that film a little bit and why yeah. is it important for you to show, you know, the difficulties of, you know, walking pedestrians, bicycling, the safety hazards. And, you know, uh, there's some like, Hey, we've been asking for this for a long time and city of Galita hasn't done it. Um, can you talk about why you would take your time to, to tell that story? Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. And thank you for, uh, for your kind words and seeing that in my style. Um, yeah, I, Crossing Hollister, it's available on Vimeo. Um, actually, I should repost it on my Instagram page. Yeah. Uh, thank you for that. Um, you yeah, because that was published in like 2013 or 14. Yeah, it was like eight years ago or something. Yeah, or seven yeah. years ago. Yeah. So and now, and now it has like historical value because they actually – done some improvements it's still a really dangerous corridor but uh, mm-hmm. there has been improvements so mm-hmm. yeah going back to the film um so i think with you know what's going on with the social climate you know with the movie in the heights and uh 
um, which is a whole different conversation. But when it comes to like uh, people of color uh, stories um, and also like telling it from the perspective, um, you know, there's so many ways to tell a story. There's millions of ways to tell a story. So to me, what matters is humanizing, humanizing um, stories. That's how you make people care. And uh, I'm just a person that care. I'm that cares. You know, like I don't like being called an activist. So like um, on that film is, you know, was one of my first, you know, short documentaries. And um, I was hurt. I was outraged. I was in like, I was trying to, it just came from like a really heartfelt position, you know, like, so, and I had friends there and I guess, yeah, I'll just say is like, I just wanted to humanize it and um, tell it what it is because yeah, you know, with gentrification and new generations coming in and, you know, they think they have like the right intentions when it comes to development, but it has severe consequences. And then after that, it has like a, a, a big impact into the local infrastructure and, and et cetera. So like when it comes to that, like that's where like with my activism, like, uh, you know, activism against gentrification, uh, I used to be more uh, angry for her, mm-hmm. you know, very valid feelings. You know, my pain is really valid when it comes to displacement, cultural erasure and whitewashing and so on. You know, I am not alone. There's a lot of people across the country and, and you know, in, and even the city that feel the same way as me. So um, with that said, as I grew older, you know, I'm now 30 years old. Um, I knew that I had to use my energy more wisely and not be a reactionary mm-hmm. and uh, really recognize my skills. Cause I, you know, I was trying to do my best in the community, uh, volunteer, everything like, yeah, like trying to find my place. And I realized like, you know what? I've been, I have, have, I have this track record. I have this love. I have this passion. I love speaking. I have these skills. Um, I'm going to do this with that. I'm going to instill historical consciousness because a lot of people would ask me with my activism, though, like question my, my, my anger of like, why do I feel so passionate about, uh, about uh, displacement and, you know, Ortega Park and, you know, Milk Buzz and, and all that. And I'm just like, it's, it's because I grew up here. I have that memory. And now with my work, I instill a historical consciousness, whether, you know, you're a new person, you're from Westmont College, UCSB, you're a techie, you're a tourist. Um, I'm letting you folks know that, hey, we have culture here, uh, we have history here, and, um, you know, there's people's lives, because when you don't have that historical consciousness, that's where it's easier to rubber stamp uh, cases and um, public, that's where, like, public relations comes in, and, and um, so, yeah, they, so yeah, historical consciousness, and that's my form of like activism, advocacy type of thing against gentrification. I don't know if that answered. Yeah. No, no, no. I, I just thought it was a good film because uh, it captured the everyday challenges that people who have to navigate Hollister have to deal with. And I think since they have installed those the lights where, you know, the, the signals, so press the button and it'll make a, a sound. And so it does slow down the traffic. There's still a lot of um, issues going on there um, in mm-hmm. terms of infrastructure. But I mean, I just, there's not a lot of people who, who wake up every day who are thinking like about the infrastructure and how it affects the community. So I, that mm-hmm. was really cool. You know, we know East side, West side of Santa Barbara, there's lighting issues, you know, there's some neighborhoods where it's just so dark and it's like, well, you don't see that in other neighborhoods. So I, I, I like the idea of um, anyone who's trying to point out sort of the, the inequities in how people receive public public services. Yeah. No, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Um, and then you had one, Anofre, uh, that, that video it was like, it was, that was really good because when it started out, I'm like, oh, what's this going to be about? Like, what's this guy's story? You know, it's, and then all of a sudden he starts rapping, right? And it's like, oh, you know, and then so it like took you in these levels of like, 
this evolution of getting to know this character, you know, and then, you know, he's just, he's rapping and he's doing his thing and, you know, those lyrics. So, um, th yeah, those, those are really cool. You know, do you, uh, do you have a piece that you're like, this is my piece so far in my career that I, you know, that I really enjoy the most or, um, you know, what are you most mm -hmm. proud of so far? No, yeah, it's a great question. Um, I don't, mm -hmm. um, right now I'm just focusing more on, um, well, kind of like a perfectionist or like it's a, you know, I'll keep on learning to the day I die and I, yeah. I'm going projects. So um, I guess like the most proudest thing I have right now is, you know, Chicano culture as B, you know, I'm getting ready to uh, make it more sustainable because um, like I mentioned, I do this for free. Yeah. You know, I do this events for free. I, I invest my own money. And, uh, and I'm, I'm also really grateful for the, all the other people in the community who recognize my work and they donate their resources to my efforts. So uh, very noble, noble stuff. So um, with that said, yeah, I'm proud of Chicano Culture SB. I want to get the website rock, like, you know, rock and rolling. It, right now it's under construction. You know, I want to do the store situation to have more of that merchandise rep yeah uh you know authentic messages uh stuff that's not like culturally appropriated in in the theme of like something in, in the funk zone or something mm -hmm. in uh more whitewashed uh yeah. you know so doing that um i am working on on a book several books uh i have one uh called the, the history of ortega park and its people it kind of uh stemmed out of uh with the situation of Ortega Park, where we successfully, you know, I, I, I humbly say this too, you know, I, I spearheaded this, you know, this public awareness situation of, uh, of what was going on with Ortega Park. I was there from the beginning with public outreach and, and, you know, long story short, like what the developers were proposing, like, wait, you're going to destroy the whole, the freaking lot you're going to take out the tree. You're going to take out the trees. Um, you didn't do historical uh, evaluation because that's what all the, the Santa Barbara ordinance, if you're going to do any construction or anything like that, you have to do a historical evaluation of the building. They didn't do that. They didn't do an environmental evaluation as in, you know, as for the folks out there don't know is that Ortega park used to be the city dump back in the 19 uh, early 1900s. Um, and also they didn't do an art evaluation with the murals. And uh, so, you know, point is I spearheaded that. I did like call of action. I'm so happy that like folks like, uh, like Mark Moses, uh, the good folks at BN Star at Latinx um, and so many others, like so many others um, stepped up and, you know, with this effort and we, we stopped the grant, but the battle's not over. But from that, I was like, you know what? I have like so much history it's becoming a book so that's coming out soon uh another book that's like a maybe it might, might come out in like a year or two years is a book called a sun uh the title's called the sun sets south mm. and um it's a, like a historical novel uh a novel type of book and um it takes place in santa barbara in the 1860s to the 1880s and uh, for the folks who don't know, that was a really special time because that's where, like, after me the Mexican-American War, this is, like, during, like, the Civil War, the 1860s, you know, so many racist laws were being passed, like, the um, so many <laughs> to mention, and Manifest Destiny, Migration, hordes of hordes of hordes of, you know, Anglo-Saxons, uh, Europeans were migrating westward, uh, the treatment of the indigenous people, you know, this is Chumash land, you know, I'm not Chumash, but it's my duty as, you know, as someone who identifies as indigenous to honor the Chumash people. So my book is going to be something like that. You know, it's kind of a homage, not an homage, but um, the books, the Ro Ramona and the Island of the Blue Dolphins really inspire me. So Okay. that's what i'm what's going on <laughs> that's awesome that's cool look forward to that yeah i want to talk to you about something that i'm kind of like curious about and interested in is you know i kind of i navigate a lot of worlds in my professional life right um but you know i grew up very poor 
<laughs> in Goleta, you know, and we moved every year because rents would go up or somebody would lose a job and we'd have to find somewhere else to, to live. And um, most people don't really ask me that. They don't really assume anything like I've had any sort of um, challenge like that growing up because most of the world I live in is a very professional world and they just assume whatever they assume, you know, but I went to five different elementary schools and, you know, just a lot of bouncing around. We were never quite comfortable any place, you know? So mm -hmm. I consider Goleta my, where I was raised, I consider Santa Barbara because <laughs> it was back and forth, you know, all around. Mm -hmm. um, and I want to ask you sort of like when I, when I walk out in the real world, mm -hmm. you know, I see Latinos everywhere. I see Mexican Americans everywhere, but when I'm in my professional world as a journalist, you know, when I'm talking to decision makers, when I'm talking yeah. to elected officials, when I'm talking to CEOs or professionals or people who are out, um, who are technically, you know, running the city or, you know, in charge, um, you see much fewer, right? There's the, all of a sudden it's like, where did all the Latinos go, you know? And it's sort of like um, frustrating for me because like, uh, you know, people there's still so many barriers and roadblocks for many sure. people of color to obtain success. Even though if you and I were to walk down Milpas or state street, even or Hollister, we're going to see a lot of people that look like us <laughs> more so <laughs> like us than other people. Um, so I'm wondering if you could just sort of talk a little bit about why you think that is in 2021, where we still sort of see uh, barriers for people of color, even at a time when people are widely, say they're aware of racism and they're way aware of inequities and you know they, what comes out of their mouth is of course I'm, i don't discriminate but in practice you know and i'll give you an example mm. the historic landmarks commission in santa barbara okay the architectural board of review the santa barbara planning commission very little diversity on any of those boards okay so why is it that we can be out in the community and see so many people of color but then when we go look at those people who are making those decisions, we don't see that as much. So can you talk a little bit, of, enlighten us a little bit on that? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You know, I'll be happy to share my opinion. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm just 30 years old. Yeah. I know um, I've been recommend, I've been encouraged many times to run for pol uh, politics, you know, local politics. It's not really my cup of tea. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm more into like the, the people power, um, organizing of pol uh, politics because everything's political um so but anyways with that said uh decision makers you know representation uh you know committees and you know and so on position you know and in in, in in these in institutions um i guess that's where equity is extremely important and and then also understanding that uh, the legacy of white supremacy hasn't left uh, the United States, and in this case, specifically Santa Barbara, which is a very uh, liberal city. Um, yes, it's very uh, conscious, a um, lot of progressive uh, corporations and uh, come out of Santa Barbara. You know, UCSB is a very, very, you know, progressive university one top in the world really great academics and etc but um i think it's just people need to understand is to like dude the lady okay i'll tell you this i'll tell you this story one time i did this historical this history lecture at la casa raza and one of the attendees who was uh who considered himself biracial in a way uh his mom was uh, mexican and his dad was white and he was grew up Catholic. He was born in the 1940s. And he wanted to be a firefighter. And the chief, and this is someone's grandpa or someone's dad. The, the fire chief of like it was, I think he was said in Santa Barbara or in uh, Montecito told him, and this is like 1960s. This is like maybe like right before the civil rights. Um you know, uh, act and movement, and, you know, still the time, special time. But the point is, they, he told them, because you're half Mexican and you're Catholic, you can't be a firefighter. And what that said is that it, 
a lot of people have this mis- misunderstanding of like of um of like the legacy and powers and and um and transfer of power and influence so it's um it's just how to explain it's just we we still need of course you know we were making record numbers of you know latino latinx latinas and graduating from universities um you know becoming more professionals and so on but there's still a lot of inequities you know mm-hmm. a lot of them are really busy as you know you as a as a parent as a, a me as a parent too um you know we have bills we have responsibilities and these other folks they have the disposable income they have in um inherited wealth you mm-hmm. know they had inherited wealth not only like capital wealth but like uh systemic institution wealth mm-hmm. of like oh yeah my grandpa was a judge and, mm-hmm. and then got my dad that and then i got this job as a well that makes sense wasn't that easy for you or <laughs> you know some people can literally stem you know connect their wealth from uh, a government handout you know like the homestead act you know stealing land from from the from the native people and giving it to uh, only uh white european uh protestant settlers hmm. so uh that legacy is there and, and and for the folks you know who are white and working class just know that we have more in common you know we have more in common, you know, people of color, white people working class, we have more in common. Um, it's more about the folks who are, uh, has that inherited generational wealth that are really holding on to it mm-hmm. and, uh, they don't want to let go. And some of them really need to retire and like, they're, yeah, I, I, that's all I have to say. Yeah, from there. That's a good point. Cause I think people see dollar wealth. I think they, they sort of get that. Um, when they're trying to examine these issues, but they don't really get sort of the inherited institutional wealth that comes from, well, where did you start? You know, where did you start versus where other people started? It's great for you to say, I don't see color. We're the same. But the truth of the matter is, um, you know, we all started from different places and you have Mm -hmm. to acknowledge that in order to understand, you know, where somebody is at and, uh, you know, my, my dad was an eighth grade dropout, mm-hmm. um, had to go work. You know, there was no, in, in, there was no inherited uh, institutional wealth for me. <laughs> you know, Working class, man, paid <laughs> always, bills. And I always say like, I never took the SAT test in high school. Like me no neither. one never asked me to take an SAT test. Like I don't, and I tell my friends these days and they're like, you never took an, and I, you know, they'll ask me, what'd you get in your SAT? I'm like, I never took it. Like no one was I, was it mandatory? I don't know. Or was it? Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> and, 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 that, and with that kind of impression, you know, like the reaction, what you said, that's mm-hmm. an example of that class classism where that class mindset, where it's like with folks who have that middle class for, you know, for your generation, when there was a, a larger middle class, uh, a thriving middle class, um, that's where it was just like the SATs was such a, a norm. It's a norm. And that's why it's like, that's where it's like, that's where it's like so offending and like microaggressions where it's like, oh, you didn't do the SATs. Mm. You didn't have your own room. You know, it's just like, buddy, check your privilege. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. Try, try sharing a room with your parent till you're 13 years old, you know, cause yeah. you know, it's that or the floor, <laughs> you know, the couch, <laughs> you know, it's just, I think the microaggressions are, are really important to remember that, people just aren't aware of um, they should be, but they're not aware of where the things they say Mm -hmm. do not necessarily mean that the person you're talking to feels that same way. So don't, don't start from that, that place, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Cause we don't all agree with that perspective to begin with. Um, I want to, you know, I talk a little bit about me um, and I'd like to sort of learn a little bit more about my guests, but can you talk a little bit about you and your story and sort of like, um, you know, how you grew up and where you grew up and, you know, you mentioned, and I heard in another thing that I watched on YouTube, you know, that initially you were, you were kind of angry with your, your work, you know, and then somebody asked you like, what is your goal? Right? What is your, what do you want? You know? So can you, you know, what was Michael like at eight years old, 10 years old, 12 years old? Can you walk us through just a little bit, whatever you feel comfortable sharing? Yeah, absolutely. Um, 
so with what you're mentioning just earlier, just quickly, um, that's where, you know, with my work, uh, you know, I am available to be consulted. I have no problem volunteering my time for the children and community work who, you know, do righteous work. But if you're a privileged person, you come from a corporation and all that, and uh, you have, you're, you're suffering from white guilt, feel free to hire me, you know, because, um, one thing I understand with my uh, processing my emotions and, you know, my passion, my love for the community is like, it's just when it comes to just like universal, like humanism, it's just majority of people just don't know any better. So I have a lot of now just patience and compassion that are just people um, are just inherently just don't know any better in an ignorant type of way. You know, one of uh, folks who inspired me a lot is Coffee with a Black Guy, you know, Royce Joyce, and um, he was running for mayor. And he says it really well. It's just, dude, we were born in, into a racist society. And folks who don't know, understand that, I'm like, look at the laws, look at the history. There's tremendous amounts of evidence you know, and so on. With that said, that's where it's so important to do the work to deconstruct uh, anti-blackness, anti-queerness, you know, deconstruct toxic, toxic masculinity, and etc. So with that said, um, I, I just like to educate people mm-hmm. and help them get rid of their ignorance and make them more aware of like, yeah, I don't want to be like a stereotypical white person and like, like offend people. So but with that said, um, I ever since uh, I was a young, you know, young little kid, we lad, uh, you know, my parents are from Mexico. They uh, they migrated over here in the in the late 1970s. And uh, we moved around from SB to the L.A. area, just migrating back and forth uh, for jobs. And we finally uh, made it official in like 1996. And um, I do grew up identify as a border culture, the frontera. Mexicali is, uh, I spent a summer growing up there, go there every weekends. Um, so I definitely grew up, you know, going to two worlds. Uh, I've been extremely observant since I was a little kid. I still have vivid memories, always been attracted to wisdom. Um, and with that said, um, just always love stories and just like writing creative. I remember taking, um, uh, you know, always loved doing my journaling in elementary, express myself, poetry ever since I was a little kid. Um, taking then from, you know, I was middle school, I was a really good scholar in a way where my GPA was really good. I read so many books, Harry Potter and, you know, so many other novels. Um, then high school came around. That system was really good for me and you know, I had really bad GPA. Uh, my parents, uh, we had to move to Ventura. I had to go to a school out there. Uh, I had to like kind of restart my friends. You know, like I said, my GPA was doing bad. And then in senior year, uh, that's where I, I've always been attracted to media and storytelling. And back in the day, as you, I, I graduated in 2008. So back in, for the folks out there who are listening, this is kind of like a digital historical lesson. Back in those days, it was mini DV tapes. And when it comes to accessibility of, of filmmaking back in the day, like I, I just knew at the early age, I was just like, dude, we need more representation in Hollywood, um, the way they tell our stories and so on. So like, I've always wanted to be like a filmmaker editor and uh, I was a news anchor senior year. Um, and that's where I got my experience in, in multimedia and storytelling, you know, mm-hmm. first hands on and like influence and you know using my voice and uh from there became uh, i got a scholarship uh at the technology development center and my certificate was as a uh, multimedia technician i'm essentially adobe uh softwares photoshop after effects premiere pro uh you know and design stuff like that um so with that I, I and it was like this was now the 2010s and uh, it was extremely difficult. Like I had this really valuable skills, but it was extremely difficult to get like jobs. 
um, because I didn't have that inherited wealth, uh, that network, good old boys network. You know, at that time, like I mentioned, I was going to Ventura, graduated from Buena, went to Moore Park College. Mm -hmm. And for the folks who don't know, Moore Park College is where all the people of the industry who live in the Valley or Sherman Oaks or Thousand Oaks, since the, the community colleges in Los Angeles are so crowded, it's like, dude, just send your kid to Moore Park College. So that's where I got exposed to um, like more folks of the industry. You know, shout, shout out to Candy Larson, uh, who's like, uh, I believe it was like the, she was like the head of the, the video production department. And she really validated my passion for filmmaking. And, and uh, from there, I, it was just crazy. I was meeting people like super privileged sheltered people. Like my, I had a friend whose dad was uh, worked for, he was a writer for Marvel comics, mm. Mm. you know? And he, everyone was kissing his ass as in like, Oh, he's the Messiah and all that. His dad was like Marvel, like all this, like kissing his ass and that. And like, he was getting more opportunities and all that. Then I had some other friends who were like, um, indie filmmakers and like they were able to like invest like six to eight thousand dollars they had all this family support you know they have a cousin who's like in the industry um you know you know they never had their own rooms and etc middle class people mm -hmm. or even more so with that said I, I i was just like in there and i was just like and the only reason why like these folks like really um uh, like respected me is because it was my passion that got me like into these spaces. And, and uh, then from there, uh, went back to Santa Barbara city college, Manuel Zeta, uh, Curtis Bieber. He's amazing. Uh, college, yeah. yeah. He's for the film students taking them all you uh, ignorant young adults. I'm saying that in a very humble way, mm -hmm. you guys are not worthy for Curtis Bieber. He is amazing. Mm -hmm. Um. So with that said, uh, yeah, I learned so much from, yeah. Go ahead. Do you, uh, this is a really dumb question because I know the answer, but I mean, can, can you talk about uh, like overcoming discrimination, overcoming racism that you've experienced? Um, you know, what, how have people treated you? How have people helped you? Um, you know, what, what are some of the challenges you faced that you've had to say, this isn't fair and I'm going to, I'm going to show you why, you know? Yeah, absolutely. Um, and, you know, that's perfect timing for that question, because in this, uh, you know, the story I'm sharing, it's like now in the mid 20s, that's where I started experiencing, you know, a lot of challenges. Um, so one thing, my experience is very unique, um, as in I'm aware of my colorism. You know, a lot of people think I'm ethnically, I'm, I'm like ethnically, ethnically ambiguous, some people think I'm only half Mexican or just Italian or like South American, et cetera. So I have that type of privilege yeah. to be able to go into more spaces yeah. compared to like my cousins and my friends who are more uh, of more brown skin of, uh, of that complexion. Um, so, yeah. Um, yes, I, I did know that in some spaces people felt more comfortable because of my colorism. But I know in other spaces where it's just like, like they did not respect me. There was like really, really fucked up like situations as in like my work is so valuable and like you, you, like you totally undervalue it. Like, or like so many, like I work in the nonprofit industry and, and I don't know. It's like, I, my thing is like, Yes, I did experience challenges. Um, a lot of it is also to like classism, like the microaggressions. I'm like, dude, like, I don't ha have the resources to do this. Like, I don't have the money. This is extremely difficult for me to do this. Like, like, you say you were going to give me like um, uh, a raise if I go back to school. I can't like, I'm at least one class. You said at least one class and like, you're now telling me I have to be a full-time student and mm. while being a single dad and this fucking low paying job, mm. like extremely, extremely messed up. Mm -hmm. And, but I, I'm a really mature person and, and as a person 
who hears this hears me out right now. You know, I'm a very mature person where it's like, you know, how you say, I don't like to live in the past, but I don't forget. And uh, I don't know, man. It's just like, I, I, I'm I not going to be frustrated and say like, oh, the system is against me and, you know, I can't get ahead. I used to be really bitter in that way, but I have to be proactive in a way where it's like, yeah, the system is against me. And, but my story is going to be greater than that. My story is just not going to be, oh, like bitterness and like the system held me back. No one gives me um, uh, opportunities and et cetera, or this decision makers don't give me time of day or they don't respect my work. I'm like, all right, well, I don't need your validation. You know, I'll keep on doing it. And uh, my, and that's, that's kind of like the story of overcoming. Yeah, no, I think that's really important because, um, you know, I always feel like, you know, myself, a lot of people of color that um, you can only fail once, you know, and then that you get written off. And a lot of people, other types of people, we can fail 10 times and there's still somebody ready to help you, you know, and it's like, that's mm-hmm. not fair. It's, you know, how come I don't get that kind of thing? But it's not helpful in my, in my speaking for me, um, it's not helpful to uh, point fingers and blame and wallow mm-hmm. because it's not going to change it that way. The only way you can change anything is by, yeah, working harder, working better, working smarter, showing them, you know, I can do this with or without you. And uh, uh, one day you'll regret, you know, if you were a barrier or a roadblock, you know? And so I just, I always sort of look in and say, I'm going to do this and it's going to feel even better knowing that I was able to, to overcome this. And I want to ask you just a couple of things about uh, elected officials and politics. You know, I cover a lot of government, you know, and we went to district elections and we see more Latino and Mexican American representation because of that. I wonder what your thoughts are. Um, is it a win if um, we see more Mexican Americans in uh, office serving? Is that enough? Uh, should we hold them to a standard of, okay, now you're there. But now you have to do something with that. It's not enough to be there. You can't just sit there and be happy that the face is there. We need content. We need substance. You know, mm. um, that's obviously how I feel. You know, I feel like we're held to a different standard. You know, like like people of color, when, when people look at us, there's like innate skepticism sometimes. You know, I don't want to yeah. say everyone's like that. But a lot of times there's like, hmm, what's up with that? You know, and there's mm-hmm. like a judgment that goes in that you may not see with some others. Um, so I think we got to work harder. We got to show, you know, hey, we got making the most of these opportunities. What's your take on elected officials? Is it a win just for them to be there or do we need more of, out of that? Yeah, no, that's a great question. And that's where it's, you know, it's not a, just a black and white situation. Um, so I actually written a, a post. You can find it on on my Instagram page, Chicano Culture SB, and I, I titled, titled it you know, chi- you know, Chicanos in politics 50 years later. And, you know, I mentioned, you know, every, everyone from, you know, Judge Frank Ochoa, you know, the youngest judge in the state of California in history, um, you know, Monique Limon, uh, Salud Cabrajal, uh, Alejandro Gutierrez, Oscar Gutierrez, uh, Kathy Murillo, and, um, uh, you know, it's a lot of representation. And then there's a lot of other, you know, Hispanic uh, politicians, uh, Latinx politicians, um, and also f- folks of different heritage of Latin America, of Central America, and so on. Um, with that said, um, I think it is a, a great win. It is a good thing when it comes to representation, when it comes to equity change. Um, from 50 years ago to today, in that post I, I pointed out dude this is huge in history this is like you haven't seen this time this much representation in Santa Barbara since like the 1860s mm-hmm. <laughs> literally since the 1860s yeah. you didn't see that many Spanish surnames and positions of power yeah. uh, decision makers so it's we're living a special time and I think it's something to be proud of and uh, but now you know not to just simply glorify you know, glorify and hang up my hat there and call and, you know, have my best faith with them. Now it's where accountability is so important. 
Um, yeah, accountability, you know, it's a really simple word, accountable. Um, who are you accountable? Who are you representing? In this case, you know, your district, your county, um, you know, whatever in that case, you know, they're representing us in Congress and in a federal level and so on. Um, um, you know, does your actions match the interests of your, you know, your community or do your actions represent the interests of more of like your donors, uh, whether it's like the oil industry, the real estate industry, um, stuff like that. And that's where um, like neoliberalism comes in play where, yeah, no, like people of color and positions is great, but I want to know their track record. I want to know their position when it comes to classism, their compassion, their empathy to the people. Um, are they talking about community? When they say community, are they talking about the business community? Are they, or are they talking about like the actual working class? Um, and when they're talking about like improving the infrastructure, are you talking about improving the infrastructure for, for like the extra uh, wealthy elite and their interests, like giving them condos and so on? Uh, then it has like a, a negative impact to the local infrastructure where people have to commute farther and farther to Santa Barbara and actually gaining the right workers. Um, you know, that's where, that's where it's really critical. And that's where um, it's, it's a bit important to critique our, uh, our politicians and our leaders and let them know what's up, hold them accountable. So um, as at this time, um, I know no one's perfect, you know, we're human. Um, you know, they were elected into this system. You know, these problems, they were inherited uh, so yes, I, I'm, I'm compassionate and understanding, but there's a crisis going on, you know, the housing crisis, the renters crisis. Um, I'm going to be one of the speakers for this Saturday, um, at the, at the rally at the train station organized by cause. Um, cause that's a huge thing. Um, what they're going on with the eviction notice of June 30, you know, how is that going to devastate our community even more? Um, how are gonna? How is our politicians gonna step up? Uh, and one thing I like to mention when it comes to um, you know politicians who have done it right. You know, recently, um, you know, Alejandro Gutierrez. She's since the Ortega Park uh, master plan situation and gentrification and and so on. Alejandro Gutierrez did an amazing job as a leader, stepping up you know, representing the community interests and exposing this project uh, for what it is, you know, question it. It's healthy to question projects. Um, and we stopped it. So I just want to give credit to and shout out to Alejandra Gutierrez. I hope she uh, runs again. Um, we don't need uh, any, um, we don't need like a real estate uh, candidate who happens to have a Spanish surname. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And isn't that too bad too, how often um, some of the parties or, you know, <laughs> those who are in charge politically, they'll pick like, Oh, this person can win because they have this name and they meet this demographic and yeah. we can get behind them. And like, it's unfortunate that that's how, Sometimes it works instead of just finding the most qualified candidate to run. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's really briefly, that's where identity politics comes up to play. And I always tell folks, yes, it's, it's good to understand identity politics. Um, but it's extremely more with, with identity, pol all, with identity politics is to have historical consciousness. And that's where uh, conservatives, um, have used identity con uh, identity politics into their favor, but they're missing the key component, the historical consciousness. And so, yeah, identity politics. <laughs> well, Michael, I really appreciate your time. Uh, we should probably wrap up here, but I mean, I just want to say I really appreciate your work and um, I think it's really important. I look forward to what's to come, what you're going to continue to do. I didn't realize you were 30. So you, you've done a lot already. Thank you. You got a lot more that you're going to do. Um, it's super important. Um, no one is doing what you're doing and um, we need to get away from this idea that, um, you know, uh, California is, you know, surfing 
and uh, you know, living the dream. You know, it's like California's um, the, the the people in the fields right now who are you know picking our, our strawberries, and they're the people who are building things in our community mm-hmm. <laughs> that we appreciate, and they're the people in the kitchens who are cooking our foods. Like that's California, you know, and and, uh, and, and it's that's not just what Mexicans and Latinos are. They're also, as we you mentioned, leaders. We're everywhere, and I think people need that's to. Cool respect and understand that and you're part of like telling that story in a way that no one else is so i really appreciate that and um i, I enjoy your your chicano culture sb and check that out so i just give you the last word here you know you got a couple minutes you know anything you want to mm-hmm. say about yourself your your work your social media um, mm-hmm. thanks again michael for everything you do yeah no thank you thank you it was an extreme pleasure uh, to have this conversation um really proud um you know really really uh fulfilling conversation looking forward to the podcast i guess with my last words for the folks who are listening is um your story matters you know your story matters um it's okay to admire different cultures with respect with admiration cultural appropriation is bad um you know Write, you know, for the young folks out there, express yourself. Um, Again, your stories matter. Your pain is valid. Uh, Your dreams are valid. Your happiness matters. Um, I thank you to everyone who has supported my work. Um, I'm really, really grateful uh, for all the community people from uh, technically around the world uh, has supported my work. Um, yeah. And, and I guess when it comes to like fishing and off, you know, when it comes to, um, the global perspective of Santa Barbara, you know, I want people to know that, uh, yeah, California, like when it comes to California vacation, it's not just, uh, surfers and, you know, 49ers and just not just that I want to paint the whole picture and, uh, you know, tell the stories that really matter. And, um, in that way but but yeah i think i'm kind of lost at words and uh but i guess i all i can say now is just um you know really grateful for this opportunity right yeah me too thanks a lot michael montenegro uh, great 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 interview thank you for your time have a great day